Welcome back, everyone. This is the Stories of the Week on Security Weekly, which is brought to you by Anapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud or risks. Visit them on the web at anapsis.com. And by Pony Express. Check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean, pen-testing machine. For all those hard-to-reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at Pony Express. Dot com. We got stories. I got some fun stories. I want to talk about... Uh, let's start with rush to release resulting in vulnerable mobile applications. This was an article, I believe, from Dark Reading Room about how development pressures to get things released to market first introduce vulnerabilities. And we've talked about this yeah. before, right? But the quote from the article is... Most do not run any security tests on either the mobile apps that they are developed that are developed internally, outsourced from third parties, or purchased from mobile application stores. But why? Security programs need no. They must be inclusive to these things. Isn't this just software just running on a different device? But oh, it's on a mobile device. So whatever. I, I gave the example. I don't think. Patrick Houston, when I was on Risky Business episode 360, I said, things like this are kind of the equivalent of getting a home inspection. Like, I really want to go buy this really cool house. And I tell my home inspector, I'm like, you know what? Just focus on the first floor and the second floor. Like, don't worry about going in the basement because, like, I really want this house and it's a really good deal. So, you know, I don't really care about the stuff in the basement because it's only the important things like the furniture. Well, yeah, no, hold on. Put, put, Put that in scale a little bit. That's like the home inspector saying, Paul, I can totally do this for you. Uh, I'm going to need six months. You're yeah. like, dude, they're going to close on this in a month. No, no, no. The only way I can do this is six months. You're like, I want to make sure the house is okay. Right. right. So, I mean, you know, you're right. Like if somebody scopes it to, hey, check out the front doors. It look good. All right, cool. I'm going to buy it. Yeah, that's a problem. But, you know, the flip side to this that I think we need to own a little bit in security is we, we strive for perfection. So we say, oh, well, if you're going to do a release, I need to do a full-blown, complete analysis, code review, blah, blah, blah. How long will that take? Six months. months. Well, we, we need to go live next week. Well, <laughs> can't do it. And then people <laughs> freak out, and they go, all right, we'll screw you. We'll go. We'll release. Yeah. So rather than getting even some security, we get none. See, I don't think it works that way. I mean, like, look, I've I've actually talked to companies that have this problem, and and it really, you know, remember we talked last was it last week about incentivization. So yeah. if you're on the development side, how are you incentivized? Getting by, your code out on time. That's exactly right. In fact, right, we still believe in first mover advantage, yep. uh, whether it's true or not. And and if you get your feature set to the masses before anybody else does, you win. Yep. So is security, uh, and how is security compensated? Um, Actually, when, yeah, Joff, when, when Joff and yeah. Larry go do a pen test, they're compensated. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna say, right? I mean, like, so <laughs> so people still largely view security as an impediment. To compensate, you know, I bought a big pickup truck. Oh wait, never mind. <laughs> Different kind did, of compensation. Did you get a dually? Did you get a dually? Then only yeah. on my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Not not always. Wow. Wow. Fine, not yeah. so, man, but, man, but I get what, birthday though. and Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> here, here, here's an example where to think about some of this a little bit differently. Like, so for example, if you're in a financial institution, they have to have a certain amount of reserve or a certain amount of uh, risk holdings uh, setback. And in a lot of times now, you can start to look at the apps. In fact, some of the, invest- <clears throat> the regulators are looking at the apps in terms of how they impact how much capital reserves a, a, a financial institution needs to have. You can actually turn security around into a positive. If we do a cursory review, by the way, we've got to learn how to do these in like a week or less. We can qualify the risk properly. We can quantify the risk properly, which means you don't have to put the maximum amount into in the holding, which means you're going to free up capital, which means the company can do more with it. All of a sudden now, you're not an impediment. You're actually a way that the company is going to free up cash. We've got to get a lot better from a security perspective at realizing that we need to create value, not just tell everybody no because of some risk that may or may not ever happen. Hmm. Anyone else want to chime in on being first to market? <clears throat> well, I was going to say not always. I mean, we've, we've got customers that, that, that put us in the loop in terms of their uh, software development lifecycle. Yeah. We've no, done reviews. We've done cold rev- code yeah. reviews. We've done penetration tests uh, against products and APIs. 
as part of their release cycle and, and they see the value in it. So, uh, you know, I'm, I, I guess a little bit of devil's advocate. I mean, they see the value in it because they know that the, the, the that they're a thinking about the risk that security has to their future business model. Uh, and, 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 you know, be thinking about that. They, they're willing to take that delay uh, of not being first to market, but the, admittedly, you, a lot of them don't go down the path of, of full source code review. It's normally just a, a, a mobile API test of, mm. of something of that nature. But that's a pretty good. That's a pretty good risk remediation step. I mean, it's it's a great step. So, well, okay. if nothing else, it allows you to understand what risk you're accepting. I mean, isn't that just a fundamental basic? Yep. No, that's a great point, Mike. Well, well, some of them are looking also for advice from the security community as to. Um, you know, they, they may be nervous about some of their development practices and they want us to, to either validate that they're doing things the right way or tell them that, no, this is way broken and you need to go and take your people, do more training and, and actually get get some better uh, skills in-house and, and redevelop this. And either one is an acceptable answer. A lot of them are looking for that validation or, or I, lack. I, I tell you what's not an acceptable answer is denying that you are hacked. Now, Kevin, I want to I want to turn it over to you. Because you live in a, a, a metro, do you live in the Boston? Do you live right in the city, Kevin, or do you live kind of outside the city? I live somewhere in the greater Boston area. Let's put it that way. Yeah, but now, do a lot of people in Boston use Uber? Yes, uh, it's, it's uh, popular so in the far. in the larger cities, right? Yep. So I, I used it when I was there a couple yeah, of weeks ago. So now Uber is denying that they were hacked, and what they're saying basically is that here's the fact. Uber accounts are being sold online for a buck. Uber saying, I can't find any evidence of a breach. Therefore, everything's okay. So, Kevin, have you used Uber and have you seen this, this story? Does it concern you, you know, being in a yeah, major it, city? It, it does kind of concern me. Every time a company comes out and says, uh, no, no way, it's us. We haven't been hacked. But then you look over for a major news website which says, hey, someone's dumping credentials for Uber. It, it kind of gets some contradictory opinions. So, yeah, it is a little concern. I think everyone should most likely change their passwords if they have Uber. Now, now, here, now, let, now, let's play devil, uh, devil's advocate there because there's multiple moving parts for Uber. They could steal credentials from Uber and then get sold, and then they truly would have been compromised. But mm -hmm. that app also runs on a mobile device on Android that could yep. have been rooted or an iPhone that could have been jailbroken, that there are apps on there that have all sorts of permissions that they shouldn't, that are reading that or intercepting traffic from the phone, just like John yeah, was mentioning. Yeah, it's... It's a really great point, but you have to, uh, to think about, what was it, two months ago when they forgot to take out you know, their passwords from clear text from their GitHub pages? I mean, yeah, it, Uber well. really hasn't had the best kind of PR cycle recently, but it, if I had to put my money on it... <laughs> hey, maybe I, I they're would... behind the GitHub DOS. Yeah, so no, it was Uber. It was most, uh, most likely them. I, I have to imagine this is very similar to the, the whole Snapchat hack that happened recently, and we all found out it was just a third-party service. Well, mm -hmm. we all like to give Snapchat a lot of crap, Mm -hmm. It does come down to the end user installing something else that's going to compromise you. Now, Snapchat, did you, Snapchat, so Snapchat did you is see hiring the, a security engineer, by the way. Did you see? Hey, oh, nice. good start. Uh, so, did you see the CSI Cyber episode about the Uber no. equivalent? Yes. Yes, you I definitely did. watch this because it's pretty. It's by the. What do they call it? No, What's the name? CSI Cyber. No, oh, the, um. <laughs> they didn't call it Uber on the show. They called the service that did the exact same thing as Uber. What is it? Zogo. It was Zogo. Zogo. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, the Zogo killer. Mm -hmm. He was, he was it, killing it, people. Another, uh, uh, just to kind of um, harken back to when we were talking to John before about his, uh, his discussions about app privacy, Uber also got called out pretty hard recently about what their application is doing when you're not using it. Uh, there was yeah. a really great article written about uh, an investigative journalist going to Uber headquarters, and when she showed up, the executive said, I watched you on the map coming here. She didn't use Uber to get there. So <laughs> their application, Whoa. essentially what this article was saying is their application is able to triangulate your phone based on cell towers, even though the application is not open. It also has access to your phone it, 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 and it, it your probably, microphone. It probably also can read GPS and Oh, yeah, uh, everything. I mean, you look at the – just uh, just a couple days there, you got an update to, um, on my phone. and was like, that's a new thing you don't need access to. Why? Mm. So the, it, it's – again, it, it really – it kind of illustrates the point of these applications that we put so much trust into. And they, they have what I think they called God mode where they can track every single Uber mm -hmm. user. 
Mm -hmm. regardless if they're using the application or not. Just wow. get a big map. You can see where they are at I all times. Batman. I saw that in Batman. Look, you know, normally I like <laughs> to rail against companies that, you know, either flat out deny it or, you know, my favorite, of course, is, is sophisticated and complex, whatever. But um, with what you just described with Uber's capabilities, I, I'd like to think that they would know if something was amiss. So frankly, if they've got that scary amount of detail on everybody else, they would know if somebody, I mean, I, I'm actually oddly taking them at face value that if they don't see any evidence of it, they, they would know. They have a track record of corporate communications, <laughs> which um, everyone needs to make their own decision about them. But for what it's worth, I've deleted the Uber app from everything I own and asked them to close my account many months ago. Because I simply do not trust the company. Uh, no, they so. noted that, Jack, and now they're tracking you extra. You got a special, well, <laughs> you got a special malware. You know, Uber, right Uber is a phenomenal um, logistics company, and they've actually served their purpose and can go away now because you can get a cab that works. You know, and they've done that. Uh, but, uh, not in Boston, absolutely. Yeah, not. I was going to say not, not here. <laughs> Um, in like San Francisco, which is all that matters, Boston cabs, Jesus. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter whether it's an Uber or a Lyft or a cab. It's still a Boston cabbie. Uh, you, why aren't you walking? I know it's cold and wet. Just, just walk. It's, it's better for you. It's <laughs> better unless, for unless you. you. Unless you have to go from Boston to Cambridge and then, well, uh, That's then like take, the, take the sub, take the subway and, you know, just take some, stick some cloves up your nostrils to cover the smell and, uh, <laughs> Wear a raincoat and uh, you'll be fine in, in the T in MBTA. They're they're fantastic. If Just leave a day early. Yes, that yeah, exactly. <laughs> if if any time you're giving some advice to stick some clothes up your nose and wear a raincoat, I hope you're not getting a Bangkok hooker or something because that no way. That that's that's different. Never mind. Where were we? <laughs> Bangkok hookers. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, what do you it's, you want to talk about the GitHub uh, DDoS? Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't get a chance to read into it a ton, and I think it's still going on to a to a point. Um, but what I did see, um, one, it's kind of interesting. I didn't even know that GitHub was under DDoS because I've been pulling stuff like a madman from GitHub like all week. Well, yeah, there's this wonderful technology called the internet, and there's wonderful <laughs> technologies called mm -hmm. caching, and mm -hmm. all this technology that. Yep. Really, to it's take a fad. something. It's yeah. a fad. It's a it fad. could be a this, fad. No, but yeah, they, this internet. It's a fad. It's a fad. So you know. yeah, yeah I, prove it. So one, I didn't didn't even didn't even notice. Um, but apparently, they've been under some pretty massive uh, distributed denial of service attacks. Um, well, because GitHub can be used to store any kind of content. And what one right, article said that just, China was well, China was pissed because news sites were mirroring content to GitHub, and then. They uh, Chinese people were reading it on GitHub as a way to get information, yep. and then China was pissed. So not only did they block it, but they had to DOS it for good measure. Is kind of what I took away mm. from the story. And that well, that and some of the other things that they were they were pointed at was allegedly that the pointing of the DDoS was directed to pages where they're releasing sort of uh, privacy and freedom of speech type of applications. Yeah. Interesting. So is this cyber war? APT? Is it no? Uh, Yes. Yes. Both. It, did did did, but, did it, <laughs> drink <laughs> drink? Anyone? China is APT, and APT <laughs> is China. Does anyone have attribution dice we can roll right now? <laughs> oh, that's an awesome idea, dude. Where we are totally you supposed to make some? Yeah. Well, see, yeah. I don't know my three D printer well enough. Uh, oh but as, yes. But as, soon as, I, as soon as I as soon as I will, some. I will three D print attribution dice. That's what we need. Yes. So, from my understanding about this story, it, it sounds like uh, uh, there are two or uh, about two applications on GitHub that were hosted that were used to break out of the Great Firewall of China. So, anti censorship tools, if you will. And from what I've read, uh, uh, users of a uh, you know one of the major search engines or social networking websites of of China. They have a similar service to Google Analytics. And what it was doing, it was injecting JavaScript into user traffic, which was then pointed towards the GitHub page, which effectively would DOS it every time a China, user China, went China, China, China. to Sorry. a website that hosted this kind of analytics software. So you have to imagine if Google is on every single <laughs> analytics page ever, the equivalent in China, a lot of users were going to legitimate websites, which would cause the DOS against the GitHub page. But it seemed to be a very effectively mitigated. So props to, to GitHub for being able to deflect this. You have an entire nation trying to take you down. That's, that's <laughs> pretty impressive. 
Also, China, China, China. China, China. Well, so, no, so yeah, I was joking. I'm like, can I get an attribution sex toy? Yeah, that's why Larry Paul, and I were Paul, laughing. Yeah, Paul wants the <laughs> attribution uh, fleshlight. fleshlight. <laughs> China, 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 Korea, North Korea. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. Uh, there was a remote code execution vulnerability in Dell System Detect. I would call this one bad. Basically, anyone who's running this software, so dude, if you got a Dell, you might be, it means an attacker can run code in your box. The program has very weak authentication, and basically, in summary, if it can click you into, uh, trick you into clicking a link or opening an email, attackers basically force your browser to go to a URL, and bam, code execution. This is software, I believe it doesn't come installed by default, but if you go to Dell's website and you run the tool to say, hey, what model number, you know, what, what Dell do I have? They say, oh, let me download this software. That software runs persistently on your system and listens on port 8884. Mm. And over that port is where the things happen. It's not remote, but you know, accessing localhost going 8884 through some trickery that is described uh, in the technical description forces your, your system to run a binary. So is, it is it enterprise? Absolutely. Mm. Okay. Uh, this can, you know, if your enterprise runs Dell... Uh, or is owned by Dell, perhaps, then you probably have a Dell and you may or may not have the software uh, running on your system depending on if you've gone to that site and downloaded it or I don't know if they include this by default. The article didn't say. Well, so the way, the, the thing, the question I always like to ask, right? I mean, if there's a hundred things that as a CISO, I need to be prepared to brief somebody on or take action to, I, what I'm hearing from you guys is if I if I know that we're on Dell products, I should probably go check my, whatever my build spec looks like. And if we're building machines that have system detect, I should probably check the version of it. And if it's this vulnerable version, you guys would rate this as pay attention to it and move quickly? Yeah, yeah. You got to patch this one. Yeah, you have to discover this in your environment and patch it, especially if you're like a Dell shop. I mean, if you're not a Dell shop and you, some people may have Dells, yeah, it's on your radar, but it's not critical. Well, I'd want to but know like, who had the Dells, right? Yeah. If, it's, if the executive team all went with Dell, then um, you I'd got yeah, you got to patch. Probably got to pay attention. Yep. Yeah. Well, you you need to work on your profitability and <laughs> up your game. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Ooh, burn. Nice. Says says the Mac lover Jack. Yeah. Uh, Jack that, that's that's yeah. Jack. <laughs> so, did you guys hear? Did you guys hear about the flaw that allows you to delete YouTube videos? There was no technical description that I know of. Um, but the person who discovered the bug, who got paid, you upwards, say flaw, I say feature. Yeah, it's exactly. <laughs> well, if, if, hey, if only you could use it to delete comments on YouTube yes. it would make the world a better place. <laughs> yes. no, we just need so, to delete Justin Bieber and One Direction from yeah, YouTube. Yeah, so the, the developer said he spent seven hours finding the bugs and resisted the near overwhelming urge to clean up Bieber's channel. Um, <laughs> he got paid $5,000. Is that a euphemism? I'm going to clean up Bieber's channel. Yes, <laughs> that's a euphemism. The guy got paid $5,000 plus another 1000 Three hundred and thirty-seven dollars. Yeah, I don't uh, know Google's payout for for bugs, but apparently there's a one three three seven number in there. Aren't they clever? Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, good for them. But my question. It's very sophisticated and complex. Yeah, my question on this story really is: Why didn't YouTube find this bug first? Why are large companies like Google relying on? The masses to find security bugs. Why don't they Substitute have... Substitute the phrasing. Why are, why are we doing QA? Why are they doing QA that doesn't include security? Why, why isn't this... Why well, are they relying on some, it, some guy who... You know, so th I, is, it, got, is it an economics thing? Is it cheaper to pay this guy, you know... I've got, so, I've got some thoughts, but I want to hear from Jack $6,337 to find it? I mean, that's probably cheaper than paying someone whatever their salary would be to mm -hmm. go find bugs all day long. Maybe. I don't know. I have one smart ass comment and then one straight <laughs> answer. Which, and the smart ass comment is Google couldn't find it themselves because they were too busy finding holes in Microsoft and other competitors' <laughs> products <laughs> and making bullshit. noise about it at hacker cons. Ooh. Very uh, good check. <laughs> nice. Um, you that's, know, so hey, that's the serious comment. What's the smart ass one, Jack? <laughs> I'll, um, I'll do the smart ass one then, for Jack. Well, well the, the nature of, of you know, web properties is such that you've you use the power of the internet. You use the, uh, there's a reason that, that, um, 
Casey Ellis's bug crowd and now hacker one and others exist because it's, it's actually a very good model. And if you do your own basic testing and then have a mature bug bounty program, whether it's managed or you do it in house, you get the people who are willing to spend a lot of time on esoteric crap that may find something interesting that you're not likely to find. It's just like uh, Amazon's Fiverr for, for finding bugs basically. And so it may, uh, it may work. It may not. I mean, I don't think it's a good idea to expose stuff to the world and ask people to, to hammer your crap. If you haven't run Nessus against your web properties, for example, right? I mean, you need to have some level of maturity and that's, I think one of the charms of some of the bug bounty management companies, you know, not to promote their, their product, but the, what you get when you go to a company to manage your, your bug bounty is, they'll help you stage it progressively until you get to the point where it's okay to to open mm -hmm. it to the internet right you want you want to you want to let a handful of people take a look first and get you used to evil hackers being your friends um and so yeah, even google doesn't uh, have have the infinite time to uh, to test all of these edge right, right. cases. And, Jack, that was going to be exactly my point. You give a billion monkeys a billion typewriters, and you'll eventually recreate the works of Shakespeare. It's just <sighs> it's a matter of scope and time. The, given the size of I, stuff like I'm, Google's I'm sorry, properties, Larry. The Internet has disproven that idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It turns out if you nice. give a billion monkeys a billion typewriters, they well, just Typewriters, make... not Internet-connected computers. Right, right. Well, they, don't, they, just, they just make comments on YouTube. Right, right. Which now, well, after which, seven which, hours, I wish they'd go by back. By the way, play, right? Which, seven, it, which eventually, if they make enough comments on YouTube, they're going to find code that will delete comments. Right. And <laughs> recreate MySpace all in the same fell like, swoop. Yeah. If we take him at face Ingenious value and he cities. spent seven hours on it and he made over $6,000, he got compensated $900 an hour for his time. That's pretty sweet for him. But what's interesting is listening to Jack, it's, I mean, you know, again, we, we call it research or bug finding or whatever. It's great. It's really, it's, it's QA. Um, but what companies are finding then is that there's a model that says we can outsource QA and people who value their time either poorly, don't know how to value their time, or are willing to make the investment on hopes for a large return, uh, is, it's, a, it's a good it's a good model. I mean, it's you know, I from a business perspective, I I got to think about it, but I'm not. Uh, I think that I'm not the, outwardly the, against it, Michael. I think the people that do it well um, have their own QA, but it doesn't matter how much QA you throw at things, you're going to have an institutional bias. I buy that, and you're also going to have resources. So there are people that just open up things and end up publicly humiliated uh, corporations and we've seen those and that's not the way to do it I, but you know you qa resources are, are challenging and then you know the, the flip observation is the opposite which is you know with some companies there does seem to be an attitude of i don't need qa i got customers yeah agreed well, that's not a new attitude, right? It's 20 years old. Oh, no. Oh, no. I think it's uh, look, more I'll, than I'll 20 what, years old. And it predates software, you know? Yeah, I mean, probably out of, you know, more, more than what we'd get into tonight. But th this is a discussion I'd love to be part of at some point in the future because I, I'm i intrigued now with the notion that there's there's a proper way to stage it. There's a phased approach to it. Um, and I think there's a reality. There's only so many bugs we can find in code, and we're not looking for perfection. So is there a, a mechanism by which we transfer some of that work to other people, and if they're successful, they get a reward for it? That's, I mean, I, looking at it that way, I'm suddenly fond of this approach. Yeah. I mean, we have we have friends who we could get on the podcast to have that kind of conversation. I think uh, it'd be a fun conversation. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Or I have a bad sense of fun. <laughs> One of the two. Your idea of a good time and my idea of a good time, Mike, might be two totally different they don't things. They you know. <laughs> All right. Well, you you wear your multi-pocketed pants to TSA. That's right. I'm going to talk know, I have about a great time with business that. models. <laughs> oh, boy. As one of my Fed friends referred to... Uh, um, tactical pants as uh, shoot me first pants. So. <laughs> nice. Yep. Um, RSA changed their booth babe policy. Jack, do you want to do you want to talk about that? I know you're going to RSA this year and have for quite some time, and you've talked about yeah, this topic so, on the show before. So it's 
they've just said, you know, you should at least wear business casual. You know, we're trying to do business here and you should wear business casual. And um, I, I'm not going to be anybody's moral compass. God knows I am not qualified to be anybody else's moral compass. I'm not very good at being my own. Uh, but seriously, if I want to talk about product, if I want to talk about products and services, if I want to know what your company does, I want somebody who's capable of – um, capable of having that discussion in, in an intelligent manner. Uh, I don't need people in spandex. I don't need people dressed as Catwoman. I do not need petite, um, young Asian women dressed as Catholic schoolgirls like Four Scout did a couple of years ago who can't actually talk about it. And there are a whole bunch of problems with it. First, I, I don't want those sort of distractions. I want to, I want to, do business at a business event. Um, there's also the one I like to talk about that's a great counterpoint is Sukunya has a terrible time being taken seriously. If you go to the Sukunya booth, um, there are all of these fairly young, tall, you know, statuesque, blonde, uh, handsome young men and, and attractive young women. Um, and people assume that they're booth idiots it's a Scandinavian company. That's their engineering team. People don't <laughs> yeah. take them. People don't take them seriously because attractive people aren't aren't real. And I won't name names, but I've wandered around with some of our friends who um, are, you know, attractive females, and they get treated as if they're um, not professionals in the industry. You know, they get treated as a different kind of professional sometimes. And so that's it. And it, you know what? And the, the flip side of that is if you want um, fast cars, uh, there are better places to go than uh, computer trade shows. If you want uh, scantily clad women, uh, if you want sexual arousal, you're in San Francisco. I assure you there are <laughs> much better places to become aroused and more uh, in the Bay Area than at the antivirus vendor's booth. So let's let's do some business, and then somebody that's got a corporate credit card can take you out to satisfy whatever urges you've got. Yeah, I mean, let's. Side, let, I'm going to sidestep some of the, the 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 specific issue to kind of point at more of a root challenge, which is, I mean, I, I actually don't know the number. How many booths are there at RSA? A thousand, five hundred? Was it so it's, it's some huge number, right? I forget the number. I know that the attendee count was six was thirty thousand people came to RSA last year. Um, it's expanded so that the expo hall is uh, Moscone North and South. There, I think, are eight hundred and something, but I don't know where that number comes from. They, we actually they actually outgrew the the South Expo Hall, um, it, and it you know it, it's it's. Distracting. So Info Security Europe, for example, over in London, granted, again, it's London, but a couple of years ago, three years ago, they instituted a dress code that was you know, business casual. I mean, you can still have attractive people in um, in your booth and they can be, you know, addressed. You know, they can be addressed in snug fitting polo shirt and, and khakis, but they can't <laughs> Look, I, be over the top. You know, you can't have spandex or latex clad cat woman or... Things yeah, look, like I'm, I'm not. Let me be clear. I'm not condoning any of it. What, what I'm suggesting is, it, it's a almost a lazy approach to a very simple challenge. How do I stand out in a crowded market right. yes. when, when there's a lot of noise? How do I That's how do exactly I provide it. signal? And and what we've seen some companies <laughs> resort to is somewhat classic approaches. I mean, maybe done too much, maybe inappropriate context. Right? Go back to the know your audience. But you know, I I, I think then part of banning it is to say so how do we help vendors who have a good message how do we surface that how do, how do we help people engage in those conversations and then how do we as an industry prepare ourselves to have those authentic conversations i mean this isn't radically different than the discussion of how to dress uh, except for you know how do you address somebody yeah, it, how and do some you of them, have this conversation you know, some of them are highly commoditized and you you, you know they're just fighting tooth and nail and the one that i've picked on for years because it frustrates me so are the folks at net optics net optics traditionally has some sort of fast car or race car sort of giveaway or they have some some thing 
in the booth. They have like spandex or latex clad, currently blonde um, women in the booth. They have very large PA systems blasting. So if you have the misfortune of being in an adjacent booth, it's just misery for the, the week or, you know, the days of the conference. And why that frustrates me so much is because they make good hardware and software. I mean, NetOptics has, you know, arguably it's some of the best, some of the best. Right. So at NetOp, you know, when you're talking about packet capture gear, um, you're talking, a, you know, there's a handful of companies. NetOptics is one of them. You know, it's like it's like talking about Fluke for network analysis stuff. Mm -hmm. it, they're in the top end. It's, could you maybe, and what really is depressing is you go as a, you know, product manager and you want to talk about, uh, you know, business opportunities, you know, look at what products would make sense for, um, integration or at least, you know, you want to have a conversation and say, Hey, I got, I have customers that have this problem. It's not worth getting the biz dev people involved, but we, we want to have this conversation. So I know what to suggest and let me show you what we do with it. There's nobody there that can have that conversation. You know, it, can, I, I don't mean to hijack this, but I, I've had some, I've had a vendor point something out to me very recently that is really resonated with me. I'm not sure how applicable it is to RSA in general, but I've started looking at like when we do, for example, uh, underwritten or sponsored events or things like that. And I'm finding that there's kind of two types of vendors. There's there's a vendor, and Jack, what you just said is what what brought this to mind. You you have the folks that they just it's the end of the quarter, they got to make a sale, they don't really care. You're you're a person, you might have budget. I'm going to chase after you, and and those are the people that our industry has a tendency to shun and and run from, and and I think rightly. But, but there is a class of vendor that has something really valuable to contribute, and they're interested in advancing the conversation, not just through sponsorship, but by actually contributing mindshare and, and knowledge and helping people learn how to do stuff better. So I, I guess the question that I'd pose back to us and, and probably for broader conversation is, so how do we engender those conversations? How do we filter those conversations? How do we score them? How do we, I mean, right now it's all done by, oh, well, Jack, I trust you, right? Frankly, when I've got questions, I reach out to you, Jack. Paul, I reach out to you. Joff, I've reached out to you. Um, I, there's others, obviously, I trust that I reach out to. How do we do a better job than of an industry where we can surface good stuff up and we don't need to resort to things like this? Uh, as much as I'd like to say we should all act like grown-ups, um, <laughs> I've right. got to say that the, the consumer, we need to educate the consumer on what to expect, too. Uh, because a lot of consumers want that. You know, having come from the car business, um, the auto dealers convention, um, should anyone listening ever develop a an excess of faith in humanity, I invite you to figure a way to crash <laughs> the auto dealers convention, <laughs> and it will be cured instantly. Uh, you know, if you go to something like uh, the SEMA convention, the Specialty Equipment Manufacturers Association, that's what you expect in a car show. It's it's full of booth of uh of scantily clad uh women um you know but we can be better one of the things that i liked about uh the company i worked for before joining this one everybody knows where we work but you know i, I try to avoid over promoting it but you know we have sales engineers in our booths uh, at these events we bring people yeah. with technical skill the the company i worked at before we not only had uh, you know sales engineering, we actually were a small enough company that we that the senior support people were also in sales engineering. So we actually had support engineers, advanced support engineers in the booth. Now that doesn't help you get a lead because a lot of companies really, as you said, they're they're focused on making the number this month or this quarter. And the blind, I mean, you need to grow a company if you're if you're going to play that game. But the thing that so many of these companies overlook is that uh, acquisition cost for a new customer is dramatically higher than retention cost for existing Bingo. customers. And if you understand that, then you have kind of a, a split idea. You're trying to capture new ideas. You're trying to capture new mindshare, but you're prepared to interact with people who are already giving you money. Because if I make you happy as my customer today, at the, you know, in, in three months when it's time to renew, um, that's just a rollover. You know, that's, there's, there's no, there's no trouble there. There's a company that I won't name that used to run 112, 114% renewal rate annually because they made such an effort in the security space of keeping their customers happy that they, they did more upsell at renewal 
than doing um than they lost. And so that the message, sort of mindset just really means that you put different sets of resources available. You have people willing sure. to have a conversation and, and to listen. The last thing I'll say on that is um, a lot of times at these events, they only want to talk. They don't want to listen. And um, you've got to be able to do both. So, you know, I mean, look, I, I you know, I, I get pitched a lot. I'm I'm not going to RSA this year. I'm, I I thought about it. I thought about it too late. It didn't it didn't make sense. Maybe I'll actually go back next year that I've dipped my toes back into going to conferences. But what it feels like, I mean, I get pitches all the time when I write for CSO, and and a, a lot of them are they're generic. They're, there's no interest to it. There's nothing exciting. And to your point, they don't particularly want to listen. I feel like then as an industry, we need to do a better job of 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 appreciating those that are offering value. And uh, maybe we do. I mean, you know, economically, maybe we're already there. But I, I, I would love to see more amplification of the people that are doing it right. Uh, I mean, you know, Jack, you and Paul are part of an organization that is, is generally seen as doing it right. Um, I think that there's others out there. Uh, I mean, actually, you know, Joff, I mean, you, you know, you're part of a group doing it right. Um, those things are great and you guys don't seem to resort to those types of tricks. I don't think I don't, but, but I guess my point is, I don't think the answer is, is, um, I don't have any problem with what RSA did, but I don't think that long-term the answer is to ban stuff because all you do is, is it's the fallacy of controls. We're creating new opportunities for people to find ways to go around stuff. What I'm, what I'm curious about then is how do we as an industry embrace the organizations that engage in constructive listening, that contribute value, that understand that relationship is what's important to us and they're willing to make those investments into the relationship other than just, hey, well, support them and renew the contracts. But but who are those people? Let's go have those conversations. Let's let's give them a high five. Instead of tearing everybody apart, let's say, hey, you want some value? Go to XYZ. They're doing a great job. I, I Personally, I'd like to see more of that. And I'll tell you, those are the companies I'm happy to write about. And, and Mike, I, I agree with your point. I, I like the conferences to help people more to be able to get more out of the conference and get out of it what they want to get out of it. And I think you're right. Some have resorted to the booth babes in order to get out of it what they want to get out of it. And that's not necessarily the right approach. And I think as this industry grows, it's harder and harder to go to a conference and stand out. And it's harder because people will come to me and go, how do I stand out at a conference? And I'm like, today? I I don't know. Yeah, no, it's an impossible challenge. No question. Yeah. Uh, with that, we're going to take a short break. Come back and wrap up the show. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks to Mike, Jack, Joff, and Kevin on the lines via Skype helping us uh, interview Mr. John McAfee, talk about the Dapper Hacker, and cover the stories for the week. And, of course, none other than Mr. Larry Pesci in studio. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Larry, very quickly, how was CCDC this year? It was awesome. It was yeah. a great time. Oh, good. Um, you know, as usual, things were, were loads of fun. Uh, Costas Turgis did a great job as being oh, the CEO. he's awesome. He was the uh, metro executive. The metrosexual yeah. executive. The metrosexual it, executive. It was, uh, he, he dresses nicely, though. He always has a does. suit. Yeah. <clears throat> he does. But, uh, no, it was, it was great as usual. Good to see uh, some folks back. Um, some of them, some of the students asked about you. They were sad nice. you weren't there. Um, but we had a great time, and I'm officially retired from doing CCDC badges. <laughs> really? Yes. That was it. That <laughs> yep. was the last one. That's the last one. You're on to bigger and better things. Uh, I'm on to I'm on to other things. Let's other put it things. that way. I don't know whether they're bigger and better, but I'm on to I'm on to other things. Nice. Um, but I'll be back in some sort of advisory capacity next year and Good. that type of stuff. So. Cool. Well, thanks everyone for listening. That concludes this edition of Security Weekly. Larry, take oh, I love it. <laughs> oh, hold it up a little higher. And question for the free shirt. Send us your best cocktail recipe to PSW at securityweekly.com. We'll pick a winner. We'll drink your drink on the show, and you'll get a free hack naked shirt. That's PSW mm. at securityweekly.com. Thanks for listening. And, we'll see everyone for, next and, week. And, and for those that couldn't see this, it's, uh, in fact, over. And out. <laughs> <laughs>